Hi there, it's Mark and in today's Lightroom tutorial we're going to be following on from some previous videos. I will link to them up there as and when necessary where we looked at calibration very briefly and why I've got calibration set as the second panel down in my develop module in Lightroom because it is quite important. We're also going to be taking a look at contrast. So in our basic panel we've got a contrast slider. And I'm going to put it to you that it's not necessarily your friend because it can do more harm than is good if you don't use it correctly. So I'm going to show you different ways to approach applying contrast which doesn't necessarily rely on the contrast slider. Now to help us do that I've got some pictures and those pictures are sitting in a zip file waiting for you to go and pause me, click on it, download, get them into Lightroom get a cup of tea and get ready to crack on and the link to those is down below in the doobly do. I'll also include these separate pictures I've got to help explain as we go through. So I've got a version of each of these pictures we're going to use today with this colour wheel on which become apparent why and these tonal values there. Hopefully this will all make sense, you'll find it riveting, you'll really want to smash that subscribe button, click on the like Oh, and the bell to be notified of future videos. Seriously though, any questions, state in the comments and do click on the like. It takes seconds to do if you think this warrants it, but it tells YouTube I'm here, I'm making videos and that people are actually engaging with them. And that's that helps me get in front of more people to give this free content away. Anyway, titles are ready. I can hear them queuing up at the side of my monitor. I'm gonna let them roll over and we're going to get cracking. See you very shortly. Before we talk about calibration, which is here, I want to talk about how your camera actually captures the colours. Spoiler, it doesn't capture colour. Anyhow, let's look at this picture in Photoshop just as a backdrop. And let's bring up a picture, shall we? Okay, so your camera sensor's got lots of little buckets, lots of little photo cells, and every one of them, here they are, will capture photons of light that come in. Now, this sensor does not understand color at all. It only understands the intensity of the light, the number of photons that come in. The more photons that come into this one on the left, the bigger the electrical signal. The less number of photos, photons that come in, the smaller the electrical signal. So we have this array that is now capable of varying the intensity of light and therefore gives us a black and white tonal capture of all of the light that is coming in. Sensor manufacturers then put a little array over the top which has got these colours on red, green and blue. Red, green and blue can make any combination colour. So what's happening now? Let's take the first three holes, one, two and three labelled here. Now as these photons try to come in this time, the one which has got a green filter over the top, this one here, will accept green wavelength lights in and will reject red and blue. Similarly, one with the red filter over will accept red wavelength photons but reject green and blue and the blue filter will accept blue light and reject green and red. But the underlying sensor still only sees intensity therefore black and white. However the clever electronics in your computer that's inside your camera knows this mapping and it knows that the light that has been allowed in to cell number one is to be treated as green and then it measures the intensity of the light that came in. The light that comes into sensor number two is to be treated as red and it measures the intensity. So now we've got this way of mapping out a colour and intensity. 
Now this looks very blocky and you think that can't possibly work, but when you realize there are millions of these and they are tiny and right next to each other, then you don't really lose a lot. It's quite clever how it works, but technically every single one is throwing away two thirds of the light. This all needs to be translated into color to produce the JPEG in your camera, to produce the information in the raw file and different companies do it in a different way. There is not a standard that says this is the definition of a red, a green and a blue. If you took Nikon and Sony, took the innards out and put them in a blank camera with the same lens, the same sensor and put the same exposure settings on and took a picture, those pictures would look different because Who's to say that Sony decide magenta is made up of exactly this particular combination of red, green and blue versus Nikon? They aren't the same. That's why some cameras are nouns to have a particular look and feel. It's not the lens. It's not the sensor. It's actually how those values are interpreted by the manufacturer to produce the color. Interesting fact. Sony actually sell Nikon sensors. So you've kind of got the same sensor in there anyway. Okay, so now we know it's the manufacturers and they vary. And that is what gives different colors, different looks through different cameras. So that is a gross simplification and doesn't bear too close an examination. But essentially, that is the story. Sensors capture luminosity filters are put on to apply red green and blue and the manufacturers stir the porridge of those colors to come up with what yellow is what magenta is what purple is and so on now it all gets passed over to lightroom let's go and have a look there and when we're back in lightroom our raw file meets the develop panel and we have calibration calibration for me is important in my workflow so it's a second down. It's usually by default at the bottom to change the order of any of these panels. In fact, even to hide some that you never use, like you might never use lens correction. You just right click, customize develop a panel and you can switch them off. And you can also drag and change positions, the running order and click save. After a reboot of Lightroom, all will be changed. And to put them back, you just do exactly the same thing again. I've got a video on how to change this aspect of your develop panel and how to organize presets and such, which are linked to above now. But back at calibration, we've got red, green, and blue. Now, I'm gonna change the hue, the flavor of the red, if you like, from one extreme to the other. And we're gonna concentrate on the wheel here. So let's focus in on this. When I swing this from one end to the other, notice how much of the wheel changes. It's not just the reds, it's the greens, it's the blues. The whole spectrum is changed because of this shift in red. The green channel, it's exactly the same. Every single color is changed. And the blue, every single color is changed. That's because every pixel on this picture is made up of a combination value of red, green and blue. And if you watch under the histogram here as I move my cursor around, you can see the percentages of red, green and blue that go into each of the colors. And we are actually changing that ratio. We're changing how these are interpreted the same way as our sensor interpreted the red, green and blue in the camera to say that that was yellow, we are able to change that interpretation ourselves. So if you've got a particular cast, a common cast on all of your pictures, possibly from just one particular session or a, a filter you've had on or a quirk in your camera, if you work out how to rectify it, then you can save that rectification as a preset and have it applied to your pictures on import. How to do that, how to apply things on import was covered in the video I linked to earlier. So what makes this, this different from, for example, a color mixer where we can choose colors. So let's, let's do exactly the same thing with the red in a color mixer, one extreme and the other. And notice how it's not every color that's changing. It's reds and oranges. 
What about the green? It's green and into a little bit into the yellows. And the blue? It's the blues and a little bit into the green, a little bit towards the magentas. But not the whole thing. Why is that? In Lightroom, these sliders affect what I'll call the rendered colour, the colour we see, the resulting blue, the resulting red, the resulting aqua, magenta and so on. Whereas in calibration, these alter the ingredients of R, G and B that go in to form that colour. So colour mix is the final colour you're seeing, where it is and how you alter it. And this is the ingredients. Let's zoom out. And it can be very powerful, but less is more. You can go in extremes. So if we throw the red to the right and we throw the blue to the left, you've got an orange and teal look. Not very good on this particular picture, but you can see the effect better on our, on our wheel here. I'm just going to click the name, Hue to reset. And let's actually use it here. So in this particular image, I wasn't a fan of the green tones in here generally and I wanted to remove some of that yellow green cast now as we've seen each of these impacts all colors so it isn't necessarily the case that I would want to target the green and put some magenta in there by the look of it and the other way I'm getting like a lime green coming in to alter the greens I might actually want to put a little bit of blue change in there And I'm an advocate, by the way, you will have noticed of really wiggling the sliders back and forward because it gets your eye in to see what the extremes are so you can understand what the little steps are too. And I'm going to change the red a bit. That's enough to have made a little difference for me. Before and after with our backslash key, before and after. It's subtle, but it has made a change to those. Let's quickly look at how it would work on another picture. On this one so we're going to be doing contrast on this particular picture later but for now all those greens unsettling to you let's you can make them more rich or we can actually bring them back a little bit in the greens but it's actually washing out some of the reds in that building some of the oranges so I didn't want to change red after all on that one and I certainly don't like that colour. I think that small adjustment before and after, as you can see on the tree, makes it look less artificial with a little bit of blue coming in and a little bit more natural. And that'd be very hard to do with other sliders, but less is definitely more. Let's have a look at the orange and teal version of this one. There you go. Very good for making autumnal colours, by the way. Let's reset that, shall we? Because we'll be coming back to this picture and I don't want to leave it as a mess. Let's get back to our picture and let's move on to contrast. But fundamentally the story of calibration is it's the ingredients behind each colour. Used wisely it can radically change or even just subtly change pictures to your benefit. So to contrast, I mentioned at the beginning that it isn't necessarily your friend and that's true when used exclusively to add contrast to your picture although I haven't said that it will work on some pictures if we increase the contrast quite a bit on here fundamentally I'm losing detail in the end of Pencho Monument here and some of the whites are getting brighter that's what it does watch my histogram full contrast it empties what is kind of the exposure area I say that because if you watch the little highlights come down these here start by watching exposure if I hover there you'll see that that lights up and also there's a grayness on my histogram to show where exposure is similarly shadows and you'll see the little highlighted rectangles drop down to the shadow slider and blacks and we come over to this side and we see that it is highlights and then whites exposure is by far the largest and that's the main one that contrast robs Let's do that again. Watch the histogram. It robs from the exposure more than anything else and stacks it up to whites and blacks. That's what it does. It's trying to make everyone choose teams. 
you're in whites, you're in blacks. It's trying to increase the literal contrast, the separation, the distance between the whites and the blacks. And that's all well and good, but not across the entire picture. And remember, all of these sliders in all of these adjustments are global. Where contrast comes into its own is when we target it. But I don't just mean contrast the slider. I also mean these others. These are all adding contrast. If the definition of contrast is to increase the whites and decrease the, the blacks and, and get some separation, then these all do that. So there's more to be achieved by perhaps bringing up your highlights. In fact, the end of this monument, Pencho Monument, is crying out for some shadow increase. So let's do that. And it's looking far much better at the end, but to the detriment of everything else which has now been lifted. So local adjustments are where we're going to go with that. But I do want to bring this up a little bit. Whites. Now, on these pictures, we're going to be setting a white point and a black point. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean to say you have to do it on every picture. However, let us find the whitest part of this picture and make it the whitest it can be without being blown out. So clearly, if I go there, we've lost loads of detail here. It's all blown out. In fact, we'll just click there. And we see red now where it's completely lost all information and it's just pure white so we can just roll that back until it just disappears and at that point there we've now got the whitest part of this picture as white it can as it can be without being blown out of course that box is going to be white because that is pure white the same way as that box down here is pure black let's put the black marker on as well these highlight up in blue and let's move the blacks all the way down Notice how we've gone so far down, we've actually crept into other shades here. All of the stuff in black is just pure black. There's no detail to be seen. Let's switch that off and you'll see that. There's no detail to be seen. So with blacks, to get the black point, you roll it back. So you see a little bit. It doesn't matter if you see some, but a little is okay. You can get away with that with darker colours. You can't get away with it so much with lighter colours. So they are your black marker and your highlight marker. I'm going to fold my histogram up for the moment. Give me a bit more space. Okay, so we've now set the blackest thing as black as it can be without losing information and the whitest thing, the whitest it can be without losing information. So we're really spreading the contrast out well on this picture, but there's still a way to go. I want to work on this and I would use the local adjustment brush for that. So let's click here for local adjustments and let's choose object selection. Let's make sure we're on a box selected and let's draw a box around it and see what Adobe does. Okay, it hasn't done a good job in between the columns, but for what we are doing, that's not such a worry this time. What I want to do now though, is I do want to see what impact contrast has by lowering it. And that is starting to bring out what we want, but not enough. I think here we need to target this with shadows and lift those shadows. Somewhere around there, I think. Okay. And that's all I would do from a contrast point of view on this picture, with the exception of possibly bringing down the highlights in the sky a little bit more, make a bit more moody. So I've gone to my local brushment, create a new mask, choose sky, which is there. And now I'm just going to roll back the highlights to make it a little bit more moody. And I'm going to leave it like that. Where else on here is there contrast? Well, significantly, there's clarity. We'll use this on the next picture. Um, but clarity is contrast for texture in my book. It kind of targets the middle tones, so more in the exposure area of our histogram. And it makes things sharper by adjusting the texture. However, it also can impact color and luminosity. I'm going to wriggle this in extreme. I always suggest you do that on every single slider to get your eye in. But let's specifically look at uh, the color wheel itself. You've got much more definition between the lines, but you've also really impacted the, some of the saturation in there, the luminance as well. And the other way 
it just it muddies things so less is more with clarity but it is a form of contrast it's a textural contrast the other one we have and we'll be looking at it on the next picture as well is sharpening so if we completely sharpen this picture if you look carefully around the brickwork and stonework there on Pencho Monument one second we'll get it in there and I'll throw my sharpening over you can see how it's actually done that there's too much so it's sharpened everything so in the next picture we'll learn how we can actually roll that all the way back to just sharpen the bits that we want to sharpen speaking of which let's jump to our next picture and we will go to this one and before we get started on this particular picture I've just noticed that on my channel I'm sitting at 799 subscribers in the grand scheme of thing that is a mere drop in the ocean but for me it's only one of a nice 800 that appeals to my mild OCD mind you a thousand appeals more so if you're liking this and you want to put a smile on my face and help me get through to 800 then please click on that subscribe button give this video a like because likes get noticed by YouTube and any comments any questions add them in there ring on that bell too to be notified of future videos as and when I put them up let's get back to the job in hand to Lake Windermere here and let's look at clarity which is our contrast of texture clarity targets the middle area the mid grays the, the the area that our exposure sits if we bring down the histogram again remind ourselves of the banding we've got blacks there shadows and then exposure which is by far the largest range of the tonal spectrum then we've got our highlights and then we've got our whites so within the exposure area is generally where clarity is going to impact and it will do what contrast does which is to do a bit more separation between the lights and the darks to create in this case more texture so the texture on here is largely in some of the the uh, waves and of course in the walkway here possibly in some of the posts let's have a go in extreme and yes in extreme it's starting to approach everything but if you look at the histogram it's not piling everything up to the right and left it is flattening in the middle which we've just described so I think there if you I'm concentrating on the main eye being drawn in here and I'm going to leave it there for now let's set a black and white point different method to previous let's just double click on the whites while holding our shift key and it's brought it down 100% double click our blacks while holding the shift key and it hasn't moved why hasn't it moved probably because the blacks are more or less spot on i.e the darkest part of this picture is as dark as it can be while retaining information let's have a check let's hover you don't have to click on this we did last time just hover over it you see the blue coming in down here well there's some blue coming in over here as well so over on the left there there's one or two tiny bits which are so black that there's no information and that's fine we can live with that in fact on the previous edit I left a little black in let's have a look at the whites and we're not clipping anywhere in the picture except for that one white panel there so that's fine so that's another way of doing it hold down your shift key and double click on the values instantly you can do that on anything so let's see what what exposure would have been set to if Lightroom were doing an auto hold down the shift key double click and it would have brought it down just a little bit in fact that's not too bad I was thinking of bringing down the sky but it's brought down the whole thing no I'm gonna leave it at zero so double click any slider to reset it double click the um, the name of the group to reset everything in that group and I'll just put those back where they were yeah so they're different ways to operate the sliders let's make that sky a little bit more moody local adjustments let the AI feature find the sky let's bring down the highlights a little bit in there not as much so let's play with clarity in the sky so we talked in the mid grays and below and that's just putting a nice bottom on some of those clouds add a little bit more with dehaze but just a little bit dehaze tends to change the color so I would probably roll some saturation off at the same time as applying a bit of 
dehaze. Okay, that horizon line's not straight, is it? Let's go into our crop tool. Let's click on our spirit level. Click at one part of the horizon, drag and drop on the other part, and it'll self-correct. Okay, that's a little bit better. I'm just going to chop this up a little bit and bring it down. I do like more of a letterbox. Okay, so that's using clarity as a contrast. Notice we have not adjusted contrast in this picture at all. Before and after with our backslash key. And that's starting to come together. Let's move on to the next picture and look at another form of adding some sort of contrast. And that next picture is our buildings. I'll choose the one this time which hasn't got the uh, colour wheel in the top left hand corner. So this is part of uh, University of Northumbria campus in Newcastle upon Tyne. Well, first thing I notice is I don't like this up here so I'm just going to go into my spot clone and healing tools here and I'm just going to draw around that and see if Lightroom will just get rid of it for me. Something that big would have normally have had to be go in, did I miss a bit in the middle there? Backspace. Let's try that again. Make my brush a bit bigger. Yeah, something like this would have normally have had to go into Photoshop to get rid of if it was that big previously. There you go. No problem at all. No need for Photoshop in this case. The white is quite blown out. Let's set our white point. Let's hover over it first. It's not actually blown out. But let's set a white point. So this time I'm going to hold down my Option key or Alt key. So this is a different way of doing it. And slide the slider. And when I slide it till I start to see colours come in, that is when I'm blown out. So clearly at zero, it wasn't blown out. Interesting. Black point, hold down my Option key or Alt key on a PC and move it. And when you start to see colours in, that's where you've crept beyond pure black. That would be another way of doing this. I still want to bring down the sky. In fact, I think I'll bring down the whole lot by putting in a linear gradient, dragging it down through like so. Leave a little bit more of a glow at the top. Bring the highlights down. Bring the exposure down. Put a bit of clarity in there. And bring the whites down. Just to roll it off a little bit. Possibly even torn it just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so we've set a white, set a black. I've got rid of the glaring bit I didn't like. Now let's look at contrast and see how contrast itself as a tool alters this picture. We're getting far too dark there in the middle. I think contrast wants to come up in the trees and go down in the rest of the building. So you can use this slider to work out which areas you want to then attack and that's a good use for this slider. So this is telling me that I do like the contrast it's bringing up here and it's telling me that I do like the lack of contrast that it's doing in the trees which is ideal now. I've used my contrast tool as a targeting device to go into local adjustments. So let us come into our local adjustments and put a radial gradient over our trees with quite a feather on and let's bring that contrast down and now let's just select a, a linear gradient why not I'm just kind of bring it in like so feathering it off and increase the contrast in there okay I'm gonna call a halt to it there uh, with the exception of sharpening, which we will have a look at next. But just to recap, contrast, global adjustment, fine in small quantities. It can be used as a tool to help you see where you want to target contrast. Local adjustments are your friend. All of these really add to contrast. You don't really need the contrast slider itself when you use the others. Clarity is a useful tool. So is dehaze. And remember that dehaze can alter your colours a little bit. You may need to adjust your saturation. Let's close by looking at the sharpening. So, what does sharpening do? Sharpening is edge contrast. So, it finds an edge. So, if, if my cursor was uh, Lightroom's eye coming along pixel by pixel by pixel, it's all in the white. The magnifying glass is all in the white. 
and then it finds a change at that point that is deemed an edge. And what it will do is at that edge boundary, the radius, it will look to darken the darker tones and lighten the lighter tones. It doesn't continue that when we're in this gray, but it does when it comes to the next edge. And then it won't why we follow this around, but it will if I start coming down. And then it won't do it anymore again until it hits that one. So it finds edges, not the whole thing. It's very specific. So I've bumped it up to 100. I'm now going to slide my masking along by holding my option and alt key. I get a visualization of that. And where it is white, while well, I hold my cursor down, where it is white is where it will apply sharpening, edge contrast. And obviously that is no good to us. So I keep sliding it across. That's looking very good and targeting all the geometric lines, but it's far too muddy in the trees. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to keep going and rolling until I get probably about there. And that's where I would leave sharpening. So sharpening is your edge contrast. That's it. I've already done my pitch about subscription because it was at 799. I hope whoever's watching this goes to subscribe and finds it's much more than that. But right now, right here, it's 799. Get me over that 800, please. And I'm going to go for a, what time is it? It's two o'clock nearly on a Saturday. So I'm going to go for a beer rather than a tea. Bye for now.